Welcome to Bet On It. It is NFL Week 5. I am Kelly Stewart, joined by my favorite trio, Marco D'Angelo, Joe Ranieri, and Teddy Covers. All right, we each have a primetime game this week, and we're going to start off with Marco first. Of course, we are Thursday. Or, excuse me, we're going to start off with Joe first. Thursday night, (laughs) Tampa Bay plus one and a half at Atlanta. Total's 43 and a half here, Joe. No, no, I insist. Let Marco go. No, hell no. Uh, We're going to start Thursday night with, uh, again, you got to love these Thursday night games. Total crapshoot, penalties all over the place, unprepared players, coaches. It's a fun time, these Thursday games. And then you couple the fact that we've got two teams with a lot of injury concerns uh, here, Kel. Mike Evans, Jalen McMillan, Trey Palmer, all injury uh all have injuries dealing with it the bucks actually went out and signed sterling shepherd uh this week as an insurance policy because they might be shorthanded in the wide receiver room not to mention they're banged out uh banged up rather on the offensive line and so is atlanta they could be without drew dahlman their center their big right tackle caleb mccray uh, for a back-to-back weeks now, uh, not great news for Kirk Cousins, who once again, uh, I've been saying it now over the last couple of weeks, he is not even close to 100%. He's still having a hard time uh, pushing off of that, uh, you know, the Achilles, and he gets pressure on him. It, it's good luck. I mean, they won a game, they didn't even score an offensive touchdown a week ago. Don't get me started with that game. Uh, and you know Todd Bowles is going to want to bring pressure because that's what Todd Bowles do uh does. I know defensively for the Bucks, Vita Vea was back last week. Great news for him. Antoine Winfield Jr. they're hoping will be back in this one here. The thing that worries me about Atlanta is that they've been giving up about a buck 25 on the ground each and every game. That defense can't get off the field when it comes to the running game. Bucky Irvin has been phenomenal for Tampa, and I happen to find uh, reading uh, in the gold sheet about this game, uh, Cal, I noticed that, and they had a great stat about home teams playing on Thursday night. They've gone 39 and 52 against the spread since 2019. That's 42.9%. Uh, great stuff over at the gold sheet. And when you got that kind of trend and you've got the kind of injury concerns and a to me, a hobbled quarterback, it is very tough to want to look at Atlanta here. So to me, it would only be uh, the Bucks uh, for me in this game here Thursday night. And the under at what we say, 43 and a half may not be a bad look either. But know who's in and who's out for both these teams, Cal, before you uh, run to the window. The Gold Sheet is a wonderful resource. Right now, you can get it for 5 bucks between now and Sunday, the NFL edition for just $5, wagertalk.com backslash Gold Sheet. All right, now, while this isn't technically a primetime game because it starts at, well, 6.30 there on Marco's time zone, Eastern, through 9.30 Eastern here on the East Coast in London, Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. I don't know how I got that one right, but I did. New York Jets now plus two and a half on the wager talk odd screen versus Minnesota total 45 and a half. The whole world is going to want to tease the jets here. And rightfully so they have a guy named Aaron Rodgers running that offense, but I have some real questions here about that jets offense who can't seem to get anything going on the ground. And on the flip side, you've got a four and oh Minnesota team, Sam Darnold. What in the world? Kevin O'Connell is taking over where my guy Mike Zimmer has left off, and I'm absolutely shocked. This team was full of adversity starting off the season, and they have rebounded in a pretty incredible way. This is going to be an interesting game across the pond, as they always are. But again, I have some real questions regarding this Jets offense. The Jets defense, on the other hand, we saw what they were able to do to the Denver Broncos. 3.3 yards per play, three first down conversions on 14 attempts. We know this defense is the real deal. And while I'd like to take them plus the points here, I just can't do it. Right now, I've got to have the team that's passing the eye test for me. And that team is the Minnesota Vikings. I'm going to lay... The short number here with Minnesota, and uh, 
see if they can't hand the Jets their second loss. Oh, by the way, the Jets play another Thursday night primetime game versus the Texans on deck. A lot of travel in that schedule. So keep an eye on that one. Teddy Covers, you're up next. Sunday night primetime. Dallas at Pittsburgh, 42 and a half. Another game that looks just real easy to tease those Cowboys. Yeah, it sure does. And then it fits into the Wong teaser criteria. But of course, you've been betting Wong teasers so far this NFL season. You haven't done really well. I want to start with a golden nugget from the gold sheet. We talked about that great gold sheet offer this week. And gold sheet is a resource that I use. I download it every week. Uh, and go through it every week. So it's something that I use. I know it's something that a lot of the cappers at wagertalk.com and sportsmember.com use. Here's an interesting factoid about Mike McCarthy. September and October, Mike McCarthy's teams, again, it's not going to blow you away, but 71 and 51 against the spread, better than 58% long-term in Dallas and Green Bay combined. Of course, if you talk about McCarthy over the back half of the season, the result's not quite as good. But over the front half of the season, McCarthy's teams long-term have been good. I'll step in front of them here, <laughs> even with that golden nugget from the gold team. Key points here. Number one, we got Pittsburgh off a loss, Dallas off a win. My numbers show Mike Tomlin off a loss, 8-2 and two ATS the last uh, 10 tries. He's been very good in, in this role. I like the fact that Pittsburgh played basically even with Indy last week. They lost the game because of a minus-two turnover differential including a fumble inside the Colts' five-yard line, and because of a bad snap uh, on the drive where they probably were going to go down and tie the game. So we have Tomlin off a loss, and Dallas, very satisfying win against the Giants last week. I know it wasn't pretty, but you read the quotes after the game, you know, Dak Prescott, the, we got to change the narrative. That's what this game did. <laughs> you know, C.D. Lamb, you lose two in a row, you go through the phase when everyone's kind of uptight. It was good for us to come out 1-0 this week. It's one we needed. It put us in the right place. Those are a little fat and happy quotes for this better. And we talk about these two defenses. There's no comparison. Pittsburgh, elite level defense. Dallas, not so much. And their defensive stats are skewed because they got to play the Giants on a short week and the Browns in week one when they were just awful. <laughs> so when we compare these two defenses, no comparison. Pittsburgh, the better stop unit. Pittsburgh off a loss. And Dallas, with a pair of significant defensive injuries. Demarcus Lawrence went on the IL. Micah Parsons, very questionable this week. I heard he was going to be out two to four. Now he's listed as questionable. But the bottom line is they could be without, what do they have, eight sacks this year? Four of them came from that duo. And <laughs> that doesn't make me think any more uh, positively about the Cowboys' defense. When we consider those two guys might both be out for Dallas. Look, Justin Fields is getting better, flat out. 9.2 yards per pass attempt last week. They couldn't run the football against Indy, but this is a defense that I think they will be able to run the football against. I like Pittsburgh, minus the short spot against Dallas on Sunday night. I agree with you there, Teddy Covers. It looks like a lay it or don't play it type of situation. And this next one, Marco D'Angelo, Monday night primetime, New Orleans, plus five, five and a half. Four and a half at Kansas City, 42 and a half. We've seen this one on Wednesday morning bounce all across the screen. And uh, it's been very interesting. My good friend John Murray from the Westgate Superbook said that they saw some sharp money on Kansas City. And I think that's probably enough to keep me off the Saints. Is it enough to keep you on the Saints? Or are you looking at this one in a different direction? Well, first of all, I just want to make sure you're okay, Kelly. I mean, I know the hurricane went through there last week. You've two games and you've agreed with a favorite on, on both games. Are you all right? Or <laughs> has somebody kidnapped Kelly? <laughs> you know, blink twice if, if you're okay. <laughs> all right, I am we looked fine. at this. I know. Short favorite, <laughs> short little favorites. I'm listen, I'm not laying like some monstrous amount of chalk, just little little favorite on a primetime game. Come on, those are your Pittsburgh Steelers. Remember the same know, ones you said take I, the season win total under? I, I, yeah, I know. And I agree with Teddy on, on the Steelers in this one. But, you know, those little road dogs, you know, with those teasers, I mean, I know you like those, but uh, it hasn't been good this year. So I can understand why not liking those. Uh, looking at this one, Kelly, the question for me is which Saints team is going to show up? The first two weeks of the season, we had a Saints team 
2-0, and and they won by a combined score of 91-29. to We were starting to print playoff tickets for them. And then the last two weeks, well, they came back to earth, and they had losses against Philadelphia and Atlanta, both of them in gut-wrenching fashion. Now, if this wasn't a Monday night uh, football game, and it wasn't against the defending champs, I might be pushing that panic button about, you know, hey, this team's going to be flat to hang over in the fashion that they lost last week because they led that game pretty much pillar to post until that last field goal went through the upright at the end of the game uh, and they lost it. Those are tough ways to take losses. Now they got to go on the road and play the Kansas City Chiefs that 4 0, all four wins by seven points or less. Uh, they just keep finding ways to uh, get the job done, whether it's, you know, a questionable call by the referees or, you know, Mahomes leads them down the field to get a touchdown. Last week, the Chargers all banged up. Nobody gave them a shot. They led for most of the game, and uh, still Kansas City found a way to win. Do I want to step in front of this Chiefs team? No, uh, because it, <laughs> just ask your buddy John Murray at, <laughs> at the Westgate. They're tired of uh, everybody taking the Chiefs and finding ways to win. The Chiefs have become the new New England Patriots from a few years ago, that's for sure. But what I'm going to look at in this one is going to be the total. And what we have seen since the beginning of the season, four straight weeks we've seen uh, Kansas City where they have declined in their point production. 27 points week one, 26 points week two, 22 week three, and 17 last week. What's happening? Well, part of it's because injuries are starting uh, to pile up. Uh, key players, you've got Rasheed Rice, Marquise Brown, uh, Isaiah Pacheco. You keep losing offensive players. And Travis Kelsey, I don't know where he's at. We haven't seen him all year. He's been uh, MIA, MIA for the Chiefs offense. This is a concern as far as the total, because if you looked at what the Saints were doing at the beginning of the year and you say Kansas City, you immediately think over, pump the brakes. I'm looking at the under here because of two reasons. One, good friends over at the gold sheet has a stat for you since 2022 when the Chiefs are at home 16 and 5 to the under now two reasons for that you know one you know the injuries like I said that were piling up with them this year but Andy Reid his history throughout his career, coaching career when he gets a lead and Kansas City has been in front in most of these games he pumps the brakes uh, he takes his foot off the gas, lets teams hang around, and the Chiefs' defense over the last two years has been the stronger unit. I'm going to go with that. Monday night football, you know that the public likes the bet overs. We're going to go ahead and take the under here. I'm going to go under 42.5. I would get this now. We have been seeing this line drop a little bit. And again, with those injuries, uh, some of the sharper money is on the under right now. I agree with it. Let's go under 42 and a half Monday night football. Marco, I want to ask you a quick question. You talk about the injured player theory a lot, and I know usually it's in regards to quarterbacks. But losing another weapon for the Chiefs, do you think that plays into a handicap here at all? You definitely is uh, you're going to see the rest of the guys go up. But I know when you start talking about cluster injuries to one side of the ball, that, you know, kind of negates that a little bit. Now, it's not at one position uh, totally. Well, yeah, we've got two wide receivers uh, hurt here, but you're talking about three weapons. You know, you're talking two wide outs and a running back. Uh, things keep getting tougher for Mahomes. He's got to do a lot of things on his own. And again, because they don't have all those weapons, Kelly, that bodes well for the under, too, because Andy Reid's going to play the conservative game if he has the lead, not wanting to get in a shootout with them. In one other stat I forgot to mention to you, Kansas City's been very good against stopping the run. There's only been one team that's run the football successfully against the Chiefs this year, and that was Baltimore. And that's an asterisk because you got Lamar Jackson, who – is you know another option just a totally different animal you're not going to compare Derek Carr and Lamar Jackson in the ground game in the threat to run so uh look for another low scoring game here 
Awesome. Thank you to Marco, Teddy, and Joe for those primetime segments. Let's go see if we can confirm some sharp action here with the Greek gambler himself, VR. As soon as you see that leprechaun graphic, you know what time it is. VR is always bringing those pots of gold every single Wednesday here on the NFL edition of Bet On It. And of course, on Saturday and Sunday on Wager Talks Last Call. VR, I do this every week. I just let you run. Have at it. Thanks for offering the floor, Cal. Real fast, before I get into some of the moves that we got down on already, don't overlook the Wong teaser. Do not overlook it where we are betting numbers as it sits through three weeks, or is it four weeks? We are now 12 and six. There's been 18 teams at close that you could have won. They've gone 12 and six. And the reason I say at close, because you want the number to be as as tight as possible, meaning as sharp as possible, because you want the game to land near the number. That's what will cash a teaser. So a lot of times I urge my guys to wait till closer to close, where usually you're trying to get out ahead of the market, not so much in key teasers. You actually want the line to become as efficient as possible and then take advantage of it if it's in that space. Uh, space where you could take advantage of the three, the six, and the seven. I know you'll miss a couple of those teasers because earlier in the week, it may have been at that number, but I feel the results will be a lot better and you'll have probably lower volume also by waiting until game day when all the information is factored into those prices. Real quickly, let's get to some steam. Under 41 and a half in the Jets and Minnesota. Roger's ankle, he's going to play. At least that's what the betting line reflects. 455 over 48 and a half Baltimore Cincinnati that Cincinnati defense has looked atrocious Baltimore should be able to score no surprise there 458 Houston plus two and also on the money line three of the Houston wins have been by 12 points combined so four points average and uh they've been favored in every single game that they won the game they lost they were an underdog here they are as a dog again wise guys don't care they're betting them Cleveland at plus three and a half. But every time the books move from three to three and a half, someone's taking that Cleveland at three and a half. We got it. One, I got it like one time. Uh, but other guys that I share, tra- the moves that we get down with for groups that they work with, they're doing the same thing. They're all looking for three and a half on Cleveland. 465, Vegas, Denver, under 37. Six of the last 10 in the series have gone under, but this is the lowest total in those last 10. So has the market adjusted and become efficient? Wise guys don't think so. They went under 37, 480, over 46 and a half and 47 and a half Green Bay and the Rams. That Green Bay offense is looking legit and that uh, Rams defense looks awful. Now you usually need two teams to score for an over, uh, but I think Green Bay defense will give up some points as well. That's why they hit this one two times, got it out near that 50 number. And finally, Monday Night Football, Kansas City, minus five. This is, if you look at the betting line, the movement, go to wagertalk.com, check the odds screen, or go to Odds Logic, run that beta, it's amazing. And you'll see, notice that line move goes up and down, back and forth. And that's because you had a disagreement between betting syndicates with one laying the five and one taking six, looking for six, six and a half. So, They're very uh, close, so it's not as if one's laying one, the other's taking three. They're saying within five and six, so a difference in power ratings or in information, but there is a disagreement on Monday Night Football. That's pretty much uh, what I got for this far in the week. I'll be back on Last Call with Kelly Sunday to give you the latest uh, information, and of course, remind me to pass off those wongs that are uh, live for Sunday as well. That's why VR is the best last year on Bet On. We talked about why sometimes waiting to bet those Wong teasers is the sharpest move. We will find out this Sunday if that is the case at Greek underscore gambler. Make sure you guys are giving VR a follow. You can also catch out his Steam Room segments on Wager Talk's YouTube channel. Next up, we're going to see we've got a trap game. Maybe the deli's open. Teddy's just the tip. My barking dog is pretty uh, ferocious, I'll say. And then, of course, how high is Joe Ranieri? It's about that time of day. I can feel my stomach growling, and it's a good thing the deli is back open. Marco, your sandwiches have been a little gross lately, but they keep feeding our audience. (laughs) 
Yeah, Kelly, you know what? And we love comments. I want comments, you know, go in there to the YouTube channel and tell us what you think. And everybody told me what they thought last week with my tan my sandwich and my best bet. And that's good. Talk smack before the game. But you know what? Come back after the game too and talk a little uh oh, you were right, and we were. So let's keep it rolling. We hit both the sandwich game and the best bet last week on the NFL show. And I'm bringing you another one, and you're going to hold your nose. You're not going to want it. Uh, Seattle played on Monday Night Football, and yeah, they got beat uh, in that game, 42 to 29. But they really looked good in losing. I mean, 38 first downs, over 500 yards of offense. Now, granted, they were behind the whole game, so they had to keep throwing the football to stay in the game. But you watch them go up and down the field in Geno Smith moving the offense. So now they're playing the lowly New York Giants. Hey, they were undefeated before the Detroit game. Of course they're going to come home and bounce back, right? No. Let's take a look at this sandwich spot. Seattle's coming off that Monday night football game, and they're coming home to play the Giants. Guess who they got on deck? They got the San Francisco 49ers. Now, you want to talk about a sandwich look-ahead spot. You got the team that you're going to have to battle in the division to win the division up next. That in itself, off a Monday night game and playing San Francisco next, makes it a big sandwich. But you know what? I want some special sauce on it, too. Guess what? That game is on Thursday. They're going from a Monday night game, first half of the sandwich, to a Thursday night, the second half of the sandwich. We don't get that sandwich combination too often. Sometimes you'll see Thursday to Monday, but not Monday to Thursday. Why is that a big deal? Because when they take the field next Thursday, that will be three games in 11 days for Seattle. Uh, not uh, an ideal situation. And on the flip side to that, You've got the Giants. When did they last play? Oh, yeah, last Thursday. So when they take the field this Sunday, they've had 10 days of rest. Yeah, that's a huge rest advantage for them. Scheduling dynamics, put the sandwich in there, everything else. And let's be honest about this 3-0 and Seattle team. Who have they beaten? Are you really going to get excited about beating Denver in the first week of the season? Um, then they played... New England and then Miami without Tua? Come on. No. Counterfeit, 3-0. and I think the Giants go in there and put a little sprinkle, Kelly. I'm taking the sandwich. We're taking the points, and we're taking a little sprinkle with the New York Giants as the sandwich game of the week. Ugh! That makes me a little apprehensive because I think we may have to use Seattle in one of our survivor entries Marco. I'll pray for you. I'll Marco. pray for you. <laughs> and you already know they're going to be the most popular pick this week as oh. well. Let's see if I can't send a little uh, text messages maybe to my partners. Maybe we got a zig instead of zag <laughs> this weekend. Joe Rainier, I hear you in the background with your comments. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, Go ahead and tell me. Go ahead and tell me who you would use this week in Survivor. How about that? No, well, I'm just saying, I mean, it's I, I don't know that I could be high enough to uh, watch that giant game. I really don't. My <laughs> word. Woo! Uh, that is some ugliness, uh, Marco. That is some ugliness, which means they're going to win by three touchdowns. So kudos to you for picking it, my friend. You know that's exactly what's going to happen. If I say, if we don't use this, I text my three partners that we can't use Seattle. I'm like, can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. Overthink it. Think long, think wrong. They're going to absolutely obliterate the Giants. Who? Oh, by the way, here's here's a fun gold sheet stat. Oh, Daniel Jones. At, not during the 1 p.m. Eastern slate, 5 and 22 straight up in his career. <laughs> it's getting better, I, Marco. It's getting better. Uh, I don't know. Now I, got, now, now I need a drink. Now I need a drink because I Ooh. now I'm sweating <laughs> and I'm all stressed out. <sighs> it's week five, and mm -hmm. uh, Survivor already has me stressed out. So, Joe, I'm going to have to pass. That uh, whatever you're smoking yeah, on over well, there. You, yeah, it's well. I, unfortunately, uh, we're not high enough right now to actually uh, contemplate not taking Seattle here, Cal. But I am, however, <laughs> going to take a over in a lot of different ways in this Green Bay and Rams game that is coming up here. And and listen, uh, Green Bay 
hats off to them. They felt a little short against the Vikings last week. Uh, a little bit of rust there with Jordan Love in that first half. But when you miss two field goals and you turn it over six times, including two on downs, by the way, in which you were in the Vikings territory, uh, and yet somehow Green Bay against uh, one of the top three defenses in every statistical category, and you still drop 29 points on them, well, now you're going to take on a Rams defense that ranks, well, pretty much dead last in every statistical category, including uh, the Rams also giving up at least 220 yards a game passing as well as 73% completions. And oh, yeah, the Rams defense, just seven sacks on the season. What does that mean? It means Jordan Love will be able to pick the score with Matt LaFleur on how many points they want to score in this game here. The Rams, that secondary, one of the worst in the NFL here. I do think that the uh, that the Green Bay Packers are just going to take what they did in the second half, bring that over early and often in this game against this struggling Rams team. The Rams do have a bye next week, so they will have an opportunity uh, in order to try to get healthy and kind of right this ship up a little bit. But listen, McVay and Matt Stafford, they're not going to allow this thing to be a blowout. I also believe that uh, Stafford and McVay will certainly be able to contribute enough to get this thing up and over. It opened 47, 47 and a half. I think we're even seeing 48, 48 and a halves here. Uh, and I agree with it. I like the Packers team total over. I like the first half over in this one, 23 and a half. Uh, it might even be 24 now. I think this is going to be the highest scoring game of the weekend. I think uh, if you can get it at 48, 48 and a half, I don't know. It's uh, it's not high enough for me. I'm going up and over every which way I can with Green Bay and the Rams. Go. All right. Not high enough, Joe Ranieri says. <sighs> I'm stressed, you guys. John mm. Murray just texted me that I'm an idiot, so oh. that's okay. I'm just second guessing everything across the board. Marco <laughs> D'Angelo is laughing at me off screen. Teddy Cummins is laughing at me on screen. Just, just go ahead. Let's hear it. Everybody get a good laugh out before. Go ahead, Teddy. Well, you got to give yourself the, the fact that you have multiple entries still alive in Survivor. Pat yourself on the back. Don't get be stressed about it. 95% of the field is out already. You're still in a with lot. multiple entries. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, I mean, it, Survivor's freaking stressful. <laughs> <Dude>. <laughs> What's the point of $14 million if you die first from an aneurysm, Teddy? Uh, okay, <laughs> let's kick to Teddy for his Just the Tip. And also in Just the Tip, Teddy, I want you to give me your Survivor pick for this week for maybe anybody else who is still alive in their perspective pools. Only one survivor pick would be San Francisco this week uh, against Arizona. Uh, I'm okay. not enamored with Arizona. It's the biggest favorite on the board. And all right, you got to burn the 49ers. So be it. <laughs> right now, you burn whoever you have to burn and worry about the rest of the season later. Who knows if these contests are even going to make it to Thanksgiving or <laughs> the way uh, the uh, big favorites have been. I mean, literally, you know, right now, it's, 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 I, would, I would use San Fran. So for just the tip this week, normally – I'm looking at, all right, I'm going to buy this team. I'm going, to, I'm going to sell this team. Today, I'm going to talk about two teams and why I'm not buying and selling. In particular, the Minnesota Vikings, who are 4-0 against the spread. And NFL handicapping betting 101. Team gets to 4-0 ATS, you start looking for spots to fade them. I'm also going to look at Miami at 0-4 against the spread and why I'm not buying the Dolphins. Let me start with Minnesota. All right. First... Let me start with this. The last two weeks where Minnesota dominated most of the game against Green Bay and the week before they dominated the entire game against Houston. You look at the box scores after the game, you're like, what did I just miss? Because both those have box scores that lie about how the game played out. Their yardage numbers were really low against Houston. They give a bunch of yards against Green Bay. In my mind, both of those very misleading. So the betting markets are looking at Minnesota with a misleading statistical profile right now, they're better than their stats would show. But the bigger issue, and of course, this is a team that's trailed for less than three and a half minutes all season. The bigger issue is what's going on in that locker room. When you read the quotes coming out of the Vikings locker room every week, they're like, listen, 
All right, <laughs> Byron Murphy, quote, I know what we have in this room is special. All the outside knows, I keep saying, stay off the bandwagon. Don't try to jump on it now. Y'all can stay over there, whatever you do. We're going to keep this thing going. Aaron Jones, this is a special team. <laughs> I definitely, It's definitely different from anything that I've been a part of. I can't put my finger on what it is that's different because I've been a part of some good teams. After the first game, just with the Vibe New York, I was like, Mom, I don't know what it is. It's no stress. This is just fun. I don't know if it's the guys here. I can't put my finger on it, but it's special, and I love it. Sam Darnold, at the end of the day, we believe in each other more than anyone believes in us. So this is a no one believes in us team. I think there is still, even after the 4-0 ATS start, Minnesota is not a team I'm looking to fade. Miami's quit three weeks in a row, all right? You've seen it on the field. They flat out quit three weeks in a row, all right? I have them power ranked as a number 32 team in the NFL right now. No team worse than Miami. And when a team comes into the season thinking we're going to play in January meaningful games, and they're the worst team in the league by the end of December or by the end of September. In my mind, that is a pretty clear bet against sign. So yeah, value with Miami, value betting against Minnesota. Not for this better. Both of those teams will be <laughs> just a tip. We're not fading the Vikings yet, and we're not riding the Dolphins yet, if ever. Kelly? If ever. Mm. When is Tua coming back? That is the question in regards to this Miami Dolphins team. And then Tyreek Hill talking about trades this morning on Twitter. He had people up in arms. Week eight, Cal. He's not eligible to come back until at least week eight. That's when they can take him off the uh, the the injured. So it's a long yikes. way to go. Yep. Long way to go for those Miami Dolphins. Teddy, thank you for your tips as always. <laughs> And now it's time for my best segment because my best bets have been absolutely garbage. But my barking dogs, boy, have they been nice. A couple outright winners. You know, the Chargers would have been nice, but they they put up a good fight. We end up covering by the hook. Sorry if you guys got that one late. This week, we're going to take a small dog in Marco D'Angelo's honor. The reason why I took the segment away from everybody else because there's not enough big dogs in the NFL. And I tried like hell to make a case for the Saints. And John Murray told me about the sharp money on the Chiefs. And then VR came back and told me about more sharp money on the Chiefs. And maybe I was a little wrong about that Saints team. So we're going to take a home divisional underdog that finally got a win last week. Yeah. And finally, Jamar Chase had a decent game and, uh, they finally had a nice rushing attack. And frankly, the Bengals' problems haven't been their offense. It's been their defense. And that is always a concern when backing this team. But man, did Lamar Jackson and Derrick Henry and company look so good against the Bills on Monday night. Now you just have to go in to Cincinnati against a team that really you've all but owned over the past few seasons and get the win? I don't think so. I think the Bengals' offense is going to put up a fight. I look for a very high-scoring game in this one, but ultimately I like the Bengals plus the two-and-a-half and the money line. I know a lot of people are going to want to tease the Bengals, but with this total, I'm not going to recommend you guys doing that. Again, just bet the Bengals plus two-and-a-half, and don't forget to sprinkle a little bit on that perspective money line. Okay, it's time. Prop Shop, Andy Lang. We've got all the nicknames for you guys, and uh, we need to narrow that one down. All right, Prop Shop time with Sir Props a lot. Is that what we decided on, Andy? I think that one was my favorite from the comment section. Uh, yeah, we got some good ones. Uh, the Proppy Poppy, Prop King, Andy All Ding a Lang. Uh, Par Lang instead of Parlay, Sir Prop, the Lang Bang, the Proper Proper, Daddy Prop, uh, Prop Professor, the Proptologist. <laughs> oh, I the like that one. I'm going to call you the Proptologist. <laughs> the Proptologist is pretty good. Uh, shout out to the comment section. You guys brought the heat. Uh, absolutely fantastic suggestions. I'm so proud of you. Okay, so you guys get to vote this week. Sir Props a lot or the Proctologist? Those are my two favorite ones I've now decided. <laughs> or maybe we can take a few new submissions. Thank you guys for having so much fun with us on that one. Andy Lang, back from Portugal, has a nice winner for us this weekend in the NFL. 
Yeah, Kelly, I made it back from Portugal. My luggage did not. So if you need me, I'll be wearing the same clothes the entire week. All right, let's take a look at Kirk Cousins under one and a half touchdown passes. Kelly, Kirk Cousins has only four touchdown passes this season, and he's been sacked six times. So he's being sacked more than he's throwing touchdowns. He's only thrown two touchdown passes in one game this season. That was against Philly, who've allowed the seventh most touchdown passes in the league. Crazy stat. Tampa has allowed a touchdown pass all season. One. One touchdown pass this entire season. The other sneaky play here, Kelly, is there have been four Thursday night games. Eight quarterbacks have started. Only two of them have gone over one and a half touchdown passes. Uh, the, the the Thursday primetime games are not setting up to be high scoring, a lot of passing touchdown affairs. So I think we got a lot of trends going in this direction. A little bit juicy at minus 145, but I think it's worth it. Let's fade Kirk Cousins and take him under one and a half touchdown passes. All right, at Bump Sports there on some social media, at Andy Langbetts on Instagram and TikTok. All right, Andy, we appreciate you. The prop, I don't know. We're going to go from the prop poppy to the stat daddy. How about that? Let's bring in Ralph Michaels for some TNA. I cannot. Every time Ralph puts on those glasses is always hilarious and uh now you're asking me to keep a straight face going into this segment you know one thing that is not a laughing matter how much ralph michaels has been crushing college football ralph before we get into some tna tee yourself up here a little bit give yourself a little uh, round of applause and tell everybody what you've got going on over at wager talk college football and a nice 10 and one run and kelly this happens once every three or four years that's it i have a five percent game circled for college football and a 5% circled in the NFL. I think I've only had that once in three years where I've had back-to-back 5%. And this week at Wager Talk, $77 for a seven-day package. That works for me or any Wager Talk capper. 11 bucks a day. It'll include at least those two 5%. A great time to try me out. WT.buzz backslash RM. I love it. Let's get into this week's play in the NFL, I've, I need some help here, Ralph. It has been tough sledding outside of my barking dogs. My best bets just keep missing. Give me a winner. Well, I am going to go to the Green Bay Packers, Kel. And you look at Green Bay and you say, yes, they lost. And wow, they had a 28 nothing lead. And, you know, it's tough. But let's remember the situation. You know, Jordan Love missed two games. He came back. They got in a huge hole early. He was forced to throw the ball, and he ended up throwing three interceptions. Now he has another game under his belt. And I went to the database to look what happens if an NFL team is down by 25 or more at halftime, makes a huge comeback, and loses by a field goal or less. So you outscored your opponents by at least 22 points in the second half. Does that momentum carry over? Yes, it does. Those teams that had a huge halftime deficit and cut the game and lost only by a few points have gone 40 and 26 since 2013. That is 61% against the spread. And if they are now on the road, they have gone 22 and 9 ATS. That is 71%. And one of my favorite systems in the NFL. Folks, this is almost 100 games of sample size going back to 2015. If a team like Green Bay is off a loss as a home favorite, and now they're an away favorite, they've gone 51 and 16, 76.1 against the spread. Green Bay is number five in yards per game diff they are averaging plus 70 yards per game edge versus their opponents the rams number 29 yards per game diff they are minus 73 yards per game packers offense number two as far as yards per play on offense and that's with jordan love missing two games the rams last in yards per play defense allowing 6.36 yards per play last in yards per attempt allowing 8.62 and they're number 28 in the red zone offense love has a game under his belt the packers off a loss the rams 
are a complete train wreck this year. You look at what their defense has done, and yeah, they held Chicago to 264 yards, but that's the Chicago offense. Add it all up, Green Bay writes the ship. Packers, best bet. And I also love how many Packers fans are going to be in Southern California for that one, Ralph. We all know they have no home field advantage there in L.A. Guys, I mentioned how poorly I've been doing. I asked Ralph to help with my best bet this week. So if you guys have a question for Ralph, make sure you tweet him at CalSportsLV. And uh, let's get into it because this is an ugly one. Now time for everybody's favorite segment, except for me, <laughs> because my best bets have been absolutely atrocious this year. So I'm going to go last, and we're going to go with the guy over there smiling, Marco D'Angelo. At Marco in Vegas, you've been doing very well in football, especially in the NFL. So kudos to you. Anything you'd like to promote over at wagertalk.com before you give us your NFL Week 5 best bet. Absolutely, Kelly. We've got a site-wide special going this week. You can pick up any handicapper seven-day package for $77. That's just $11 a day. And yes, that will include any 5% plays. You know those 5% plays sell for $35 by themselves. And oh, by the way, we've had three of them so far this season. We're perfect 3-0. and And on a very nice 11-2 and run with those uh, 5% plays, and you'll get everything I have this weekend, including a 5% for just $77. Well, Kelly, that's the good news. Now let's swing into this best bet because, oh boy, if you didn't like the sandwich game, oh. you really are not going to like my best bet. <laughs> and I'm going to give you the play, and I'm going to tell you why, and then I'm going to give you a little handicapping lesson on something and you can maybe ask your buddy john murray about it after if there's any validity to what i look at and we're going to take a look at arizona at san francisco and you know what how many times have i come on a show kelly and told you you're never as good as your worst or as your best game nor are you as bad as your worst game well we saw the worst game from arizona last week they got just totally blown out at home to Washington. Well, nobody's going to want them this week. Absolutely not. You got drilled. And on the flip side to that, well, San Francisco, they got back on the winning train. Big win last week. Let's just pump the brakes for a second. That win last week by San Francisco was against the New England Patriots. Um, 30 to 13 beating them. That's nothing to write home about. The 49ers are still a banged up team. And let's look at the schedule of these two teams of what they've played. Yeah, uh, Arizona, they gave up a ton of points last week. Tell me a team that stopped Washington so far this year. Washington has been the biggest surprise in the NFL. This offense is scoring on everybody. But look at the rest of the schedule that Arizona's played. They've played a much tougher schedule than San Francisco. San Francisco's played one team with a winning record and that was the Minnesota Vikings at 4-0. Arizona's now played three of their four games against teams with a 3-1 and record. Uh, they played Buffalo, and they gave them all they could handle in week one. They played Detroit, and they played uh, Washington last week. The other team they played, they both played one and three Rams. So uh, don't overreact to the San Francisco game. Now I'm looking at this one, and we talked about in the first segment about Seattle and the situation they're in. Yes, this is a division game, so they're not going to take Arizona totally for granted, but they've got the 3-1 and one Seattle Seahawks on deck on a Thursday night. That's a bad spot. You can't tell me they're not going to have one eye down the road. I like Arizona in this one getting the 7.5. Now here's where the handicapping lesson comes in. The 49ers are a public team. We know that. We know that the world is going to want to tease San Francisco down to minus one and a half. With that said, the books generally will move this line to nine to block the teasers. A great indicator that that's not the right side is when you have a popular situation like this where the 49ers will be and it's sitting at seven and a half, 
and you don't see the books move it to nine. Even bigger indicator is if you see it come back to seven. And we've already seen a couple sharp books, and one of them is right here in town. Westgate is the only house dealing San Francisco at seven right now. That means they've got strong, respected money coming on Arizona. I've got Arizona in this game. I don't know that I can call for the outright upset, but this is a division game. It's going to go down to the wire. I'll go ahead for sprinkle purposes because Kelly likes to sprinkle. Arizona 27-24. It is my NFL best bet of the week. All right, two two things that didn't work out very well for my Chargers money line bet last week, Marco, but <laughs> – because I asked Teddy and he said, 49ers, 49ers, 49ers. Uh, we used 49, we went double 49ers last week uh, in the chalky survivor pick just to advance both entries. I agree with you. Divisional home dogs scare the crap out of me, no matter how poor they looked the week before. So if you think Arizona has a shot to win, which means not going to take the 49ers and I can't anyway, who would your survivor pick? be this week <laughs> well kelly and i think you guys might have done it last week um you've got to start thinking outside the box i know there's not many you know people left in survivor but you've got to have some teams left this is a dicey week because there aren't many big favorites in there but last week uh, a sharp when you use game theory was a team like the chicago bears last week they were in a spot where you have to find these teams that when else are you going to use them if you didn't use chicago last week this might be another spot where you would consider using them you know against a team like carolina yeah we used chicago in splash sports last week but again it's a different contest so sometimes the theories are going to be different when and if you use teams because their double pick weeks are all back loaded weeks 12 through 18. Mm -hmm. now that you guys are sick of all my survivor talk because i'm still <laughs> thinking about it from the last three segments let's go over to a team that joe thinks has a small shot this is like a little chihuahua barking dog to win mm -hmm. outright yeah, and uh, I, to me, Cal, like you, I've watched both these teams. I've watched every game, and uh, to me, there's one team clearly better than the other, clearly uh, better at uh, discipline uh, than the other. And to me, that's the Buffalo Bills on the road against the Houston Texans. And watching that blowout against the Ravens, uh, this was a game I had circled right away because I love the bounce-back opportunity for Buffalo and yes, they got gashed on the ground there by the Ravens. Uh, they exposed some serious issues that they might have on defense there. But the good news for Buffalo is that Houston is not the same kind of running team that the Baltimore Ravens are, and they will not be able to take advantage of those flaws like the Ravens did. In fact, the Ravens are having a pretty, uh, I mean, the uh, Texans are having a pretty hard time running the ball this year, especially on early downs. Uh, Houston finds themselves in a lot of third and longs because they can't move the ball on the ground. Also, something might have to do with the fact that they're also the most penalized team in the NFL right now, between 12 and 13 penalties a game. Same thing happened to them against last week against the Jags. And speaking of the Jags, that's a common opponent between these two teams. It took a last uh, a last second touchdown for Houston to beat the Jags at home last week. In the meantime, we know what the Bills uh, did to them here. We're talking about a Bills team that has won its first three games by a combined 64 points, including that 37-point win over the Jags. Not to mention that when you look at the Houston Texans, they've been getting by, but barely. We're talking about a team that has won by two, four, and six points to the Colts, Jags, and Bears. I love a team that doesn't fumble the ball, doesn't throw interceptions. Uh, Buffalo has only turned it over two times through four games. They're also eight and two against the number in spots like this with Josh Allen uh, getting less than a field goal or as an outright dog here. I love the Buffalo Bills to rebound here. They are the better team, bar none. And I think the value is on them here to get this win. I think Houston 
has got some issues on that offensive line. They can't protect Stroud and they can't run the ball. That's not going to do you any good against this Bills team uh, looking for uh, looking for a little revenge after last week. Give me the Bills on the money line. Bills on the money line for Joe Ranieri, the Jets fan, so you know that it's real. Mm. Teddy covers with a total for us this week in the best bet segment. We don't see a lot of totals on the show, Teddy, so I'm excited about this one. Yeah, we were able to cash uh, best bet winner with uh, Atlanta, uh, Arizona, Washington over last week, so I thought we'd come right back with another total this week. Let's talk Monday night football, Kansas City and New Orleans. Right now, the over-under here in Las Vegas, 43 and a half in most locations. Before I get going on my analysis, I do want to let you know about that seven-day for $77 all-access pass. I've been running pretty good. I'm on a 67% NFL run coming into the week. I'm 100% perfect with my college football big tickets since last November. And I'm riding a 67% run with my NFL big tickets since January 2023. So not a bad time to get on board. A uh, good weekend last week, and we'll see if we can do it again this week in football. Just visit my page, wt.buzz backslash TC, and take advantage of that seven-day for $77 all-access pass. Don't buy a play, buy a package. This is a great package to get on board with. Let's talk about the Chiefs and the Saints Look, primetime games have trended under for the last five years. Last week, we saw two overs, one of which was probably the worst beat of the season in the NFL. But the long-term trend here is to look towards unders in these primetime games. And look, Kansas City is the epitome of an under team right now. The epitome of an under team. This team has what, five, you know, I heard the stats about their home games. Their last 17 regular season games, they've cashed five over. 11, 5, and 1 to the under, or 12 and 5 to the under, depending where you got the numbers. We're talking about an elite defense, top quartile red zone defense. All the quotes coming out of the locker room. Our defense is really good. We're, we're relying on our defense. And cluster injuries at wide receiver, where their top playmakers are out. What do you do when you have an elite defense and cluster injuries at wide receiver? Well, <laughs> you don't try to play shootouts that much. New Orleans has offensive line injuries galore. And it's not a it's, it's not a small thing. Ryan Ramsick obviously got hurt in, in training camp. Since that time, uh, for uh, the uh, Saints, we've seen two more offensive linemen go down. Eric McCoy now on IL. Cesar Ruiz, his backup in many ways uh, at the center position, is questionable uh, this week. So when you have offensive line injuries, guess what happens to your offense? <laughs> this team had one twenty yard play last week. Remember what they were doing week one and week two, chucking it downfield. Not anymore. <laughs> it's a dink and dung offense. And I talked about the KC red zone defense. New Orleans, number one in the NFL in red zone defense so far this season. So Monday night, what are we expecting? Field goals. Take the under between the Chiefs and the Saints. Teddy says Monday night is going to be a snooze fest. Teddy, thank you for joining us every single week here on Bet On It. You are not a snooze fest at Teddy Covers. Teddy underscore covers on social media. Don't edit out that one, guys. If you edited out all my mistakes, we would be here all afternoon. Time for my best bet, which is probably also going to be a mistake, but I'm going to just start it off by saying, no, I don't believe. Okay. Everybody's like, Kelly, when are you going to believe? There's a Broncos helmet behind me somewhere over there. I think it's over there. It is. There it is. Uh, look, Bo Nix is what he is. And this is not a play on Bo Nix. And in fact, there's probably shouldn't even be a play on the Denver Broncos. But Ralph Michaels and I talked about some different data sets we'll get to in a minute. And it helped me come to this conclusion. The Raiders absolutely have owned Denver as of late. Basically since Peyton Manning and Von Miller won a Super Bowl. And that's not always fun to back. And neither is Bo Nix in that abysmal offense. But what I am going to back, however, is this Denver Broncos defense. Let me pull up good old Ralph. If you guys have a question for Ralph, you guys can always tweet him or I get the benefit of texting him. But I said, hey, Ralph, I want to know how teams do against the spread back home, coming off back-to-back outright wins as an underdog. And he said back-to-back home home teams off back-to-back wins as a dog, 55.4% against the spread. I said, all right, now what if they're a home favorite? He said 58% since 
2013. And oh, by the way, if their opponent is also off a win, 62.2% against the spread. And while that's not anything to write home about, I do want to say this Denver Broncos team is a little bit better than we all expected. I know a lot of sharp people bet their season win total over. I was not one of those. We'll see if uh, the Denver Broncos can't get it done for us and we can stop this best bet slide because it has not been a fun one. At least we still have those barking dogs. How about that? <laughs> Let's bring in the guys to say goodbye. Thank you to Marco. Thank you to Joe. Thank you to Teddy. Thank you to Ralph. Thank you to Andy. And thank you to VR. And of course, thank you to all of you that hang out with us every single week. We appreciate your comments, your concerns, anything that you like about the show or dislike. Feel free to drop it in the chat. Make sure you guys check out the college football edition of Bet On It, also up on the Wager Talk YouTube channel. And I wish you all good luck. Until next week, let's bet on it.